love the Lord with all your heart, would you mind standing on your feet and giving him a hand clap of praise in this place today? We're so excited to have you with us today. Uh, to you that are online with us, hey, we so thank you for worshiping with us today. And I say it all the time. Uh, you could have worshiped anywhere in the country, but you chose to worship with the Rehoboth Church family. And so we're so thankful for that. So let's go to the word of uh, the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you are. We, your sons and your daughters, we always stand in awe of who you are. Because you are a great God. You are a merciful God. You are a kind God. You are a love God, loving God, but you also a just God. And so for the next few fleeting moments, God, we're going to stand with the clapping of our hands and the lifting of our voice and the celebration of your name today because your name is worthy of all praise and all glory. So make known your great grace to us, your sons and your daughters. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's children said, amen.
believed I was so. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for what we get to see. Be our vision today, God. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy prayer. Rehoboth Church family. It is good to be gathered in the house of the Lord with you all today. Um, spring is in the air. It is a. T it kind of feels like the earth is um, finally reviving and renewing itself after after winter. Um, and that is actually our emphasis. The entire month of March, we are focused on our our main emphasis is that we are asking the Lord to revive us. So each Sunday in March, we will be doing that. Um, we especially want you to mark your calendars for March 20th. We want you to be here every Sunday in March as we ask the Lord to do that. Um, especially though, March 20th, we are going to have two guest speakers that day. Nolan Wood, who's the lead pastor at Life Church of Athens, Georgia, will be with us in the morning. Um, he'll be with us in the morning service. And then we'll have a special evening service at 6 p.m. So please go ahead and mark your calendars for 6 p.m. March 20th. Um, Dr. Willie Rice, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Clearwater, Florida, will be with us um, in the evening. Um, please plan to attend both services. There will be child care for the evening service. So please, please come for both of those. Um, we always want you to come, but especially for those. Uh, we're not telling you you have a free pass for the rest of March. Um, 
We are collecting individually wrapped pieces of candy for extravaganza on Saturday, April 9th. So you can drop your candy off at the kids' welcome desk um, over the building with the blue awning. You can drop your candy there. Or uh, even easier, you can order your candy online and have it sent to the church. Um, Miss Tina will intercept it before that candy makes its way to Marvin's office. Um, she will make sure that the children who attend Extravaganza get it. Um, so please go ahead and do that by mid-March. We really want to get a jump on prepping for Extravaganza. So um, individually wrapped pieces of candy, not to Marvin, to Miss Tina Bush. Um, there is an awesome group registered for Discover Rehoboth right after the service. If you are one of those people who are registered, you can head to the chapel, which is the second floor on the second floor of the education building, which is um, the building with the blue awning. Um, please pick your kids up on the way if you have children um, in the, who are in the service right now. Um, and we look forward to seeing you there. So one other quick note, please know that the start date of the senior social has been moved to March 16th. We know you're excited to gather again. We are excited for you to do that. It has been moved, though, to March 16th, March 16th, all right? Um, and remember, you can stay up to date with all of this information and more at rehoboth.org slash engage. Well, we're so thankful that you chose to worship with us, and I say it all the time. You could have chosen to work with, worship anywhere in the country, but you chose to worship with the Rehoboth Church family. We're so thankful for that. To you that are online, we're so thankful that you have joined us today. So to all of our first-time guests, if this is the very first time that you have worshiped with us, we would that immediately after service, if you could meet us at that table right over there, there's a table right over there, if you could meet us at that table right after service, we don't want to give you a small gift just to say thank you, just to say thank Thank you for you stopping by and spending a little time with the Rehoboth Church family. To you that are online, if this is your very time, first, first time worshiping with us, please drop us a line in the chat. Please drop us a line or an email. Let us know so that we can connect with you as well because we want to do life with you. And as always, we want to thank you for your liberal liver giving. There are three ways that you can give. You can go to uh, Rehoboth.org slash give. That's Rehoboth.org slash give. Or you could mail your gift in to 2997 Lawrenceville High. That's 2997 Lawrenceville Highway. And to all of these beautiful smiling faces in the sanctuary, our offering receptacles are on the back wall. And we thank you so much for your giving. And as y'all know, Pastor challenged us in January and February to do an additional $15,000. He asked us to do an additional $15,000 on top of what we already do in our tithes and offerings for our global missions. And I want to tell you, man, I am so excited. I am so excited. Okay, so you know we were uh, over $15,000. Can I get a drum roll? Can I get a drum roll? Can I get a drum roll? We are now at $36,000. Yes! I am so excited. January and February, you guys have stepped up and you've gone way above and beyond. And we're so excited about that because you allow us the opportunity to do ministry at a high level. And we're so grateful. We're so thankful for that. Uh, but I want to challenge, I want to let you know something. Not only did we do that. But from October up until uh, February, you, we have been doing what we call our global missions emphasis. And from October up to February, we have a, 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 a grand total of, can I see that screen up there? 51,000, wow. Come on and celebrate Jesus in the house for that. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. We are so grateful. We are so thankful for your giving, for your sacrificing, because you see that ministry counts here at Rehoboth. Just yesterday, we were partnered with DeKalb County Police and Fire Department, and we helped give out 600 boxes of food for families who were in need yesterday. What a great blessing that was for us. Amen. And I also want to let you know that on a weekly basis, our food pantry, man, we, we, we're up to like 60 bags a week now. It, it was 25, then we weaved to 35, then it went to 40. We're up to 60 bags a week that we're giving every Wednesday through our food pantry because there's a need out there. But I'm thankful that you're giving and that your heart allows us to be able to meet some of those needs. So we're so grateful. We're so thankful for your giving and your continued support of the ministry here. Uh, we love you greatly. Continue to give. Continue to let God. 
God use you in those ways. We got 36,000. We might get to 40,000 before, you know, I, 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 just, I just might be just crazy enough to believe that. What do you think, G? I, I think I'm, I'm just crazy enough to believe we might get to 40,000. Uh, but now we're going to continue in our time of Scripture. Uh, we want to let you know that Scripture is a high priority here at our church. So today, and periodically, we read through a full chapter of the Scripture. So I know some of you are like, man, we're going to read through a full chapter? Yes, we are. Because God's Word is the most important thing in our lives. So we're going to continue in our time of Scripture now, and our time of worship with Scripture. Good morning, Rehoboth Church family. Our Scripture reading for today is from the book of Philippians, chapter 1, all of chapter 1, verses 1 through 30. Uh, so listen as uh, I read uh, from the word and hear from our Lord together. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God and all my remembrances, remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you, all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do so, do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to, thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit, Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. And it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage, now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful label for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents this is a clear sign to them of their destruction but of your salvation and that from God for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now here that I still have. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the magnificent truths that we see in your word. We thank you for the example of our brother Paul that preached the gospel in season and out of season, in prison and out of prison. 
through suffering and through great joys. Lord, we pray that you would work in us to do the same. That no matter what we're going through, no matter what we've been through, and no matter what we have to look forward to, that we place our eyes and our faith in you. Help us to look to you, Lord, and the deliverance that you've provided for us through Jesus Christ and the gospel. Lord, help us to look to you in tough times and in good times. Help us, like Paul, to yearn for the day that we see Christ and yearn for those that we know to see him as well and to see him not as a judge, but, Lord, as a savior. Lord, help us to see more and more people come to know you through our ministry, through our testimony, Lord, through our prayers, through our invitations. Lord, help us in your mission that you've given us. Help us to be empowered by your spirit, whether it's in the food pantry or in children's ministry, whether it's in our Bible fellowship groups or community groups, whether it's in schools or in homes or in, out on the streets, Lord, help us to at all times be mindful of the grace that you've given us and to tell of that grace through our story and through your story, what you've done through Jesus Christ, that, that people can be saved from their sin, delivered from the slavery of sin, and bought for freedom in you. Lord, we do pray for those that are suffering, whether in our church family that we know of, uh, be it medical issues, be it other issues, Lord. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters uh, in Ukraine and in Russia. We lift them up to you that even in this dark time, that they would be the light of the gospel to the world. Lord, we ask again for you to help us in, the th in these things. We know that we try to do these things in our strength that we will fail, but that in you we have a great hope and a great reward to look forward to. Help us to look forward to that day, Lord, and to bring many more people with us. In your name that we pray, amen.
celebrate Jesus in this place today. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can take your seats. You take your seats. Rehoboth, before we jump into the Word, I want to just share a couple things that I have heard from uh, faithful, faithful pastors and church leaders in Ukraine. One pastor was sharing this week that there are churches that have turned over their facilities to begin being used as orphanages, where orphanages have been destroyed or have lost power or have lost lights, and in one case, there are as many as 56 children that have been moved into one of these churches. In another case, one of the pastors was sharing that on one of the main roads that is being utilized by many to flee Ukraine and to go into Poland is that the, the, basically the traffic jam isn't for hours. At times, it can be for days. And there's no lodging, generally limited or no food. There's no place if you needed to go to the restroom. And faithful Christians, followers of Jesus, who live in towns and villages within walking distance to that road, are opening their homes for strangers to come and to stay with them when they themselves are not assured that they will have enough food or provisions for the next week or the next two weeks. It is an unbelievable display of the gospel of Jesus Christ as these faithful brothers and sisters are walking in these very difficult times. Hey guys, I think I'm hearing a little bit of an echo up here, if y'all could help me a bit. One of the things this morning is that the leader of the Baptist Ukraine, a Baptist Union of the Ukraine issued a video statement and uh, it was released this morning. And he is pleading on believers from around the world to pray for them in this most difficult time. And he outlaws, uh, outlaws, outlines a number of the horrific tragedies that they are seeing, that they're evidencing, and that people of Ukraine are experiencing. It is an unjust and unacceptable thing that is happening to the people of Ukraine. As many of you know, I have been in many, many places in Ukraine and then also in Russia and my family and I, we lived in the city of Moscow for a number of years. There are godly brothers and sisters on both sides of this border. And one of the things that would often be asked of us when we were living in Moscow, and those were at times were some very tense days in the relationship between Russia and America even then, one of the things that was often asked of us by friends, family, or even guests who came to the city of Moscow to work with us would say, what do Russians think of Americans? 
And here's how we would often answer that. The average Russian despises the American government and loves the American people. We don't often make those kinds of distinctions and differentiations. If we don't like a government, we don't like that country, and we don't like those people unless you happen to know someone personally from that country. I would advise and share with our church that these are times where it is difficult It is difficult to make blanket statements, I hate X, other than evil. And that is simple and clear. So as we pray, and I want us to pray for people of Ukraine, I want us to pray for the the, just the unspeakable violence that has occurred in their country I want us to pray especially for those brothers and sisters who are seeking to walk faithfully, boldly. It it, it is extraordinary that many pastors in Ukraine have friends and relationships with churches and believers in England and Germany and the United States. They're not fleeing. They're, They're not saying, hey, can you get me out? The last thing those shepherds would think of is walking away from the flock that God has given them to shepherd in these incredibly difficult hours. There are many occasions where grandparents are sending their young daughter and those grandchildren to flee the country, but the mother and father grandparent are refusing to leave even when the grandmother could I would call on us to pray for it is our God who is their refuge, their hope, their security in this hour. At some point, these matters are going to change. Will that be in the next day? Will it be in the next week? Will it be in the next six months? Will it be a decade? No one knows. But here's what we know, every opportunity we have to stand with our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and help them, we must. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are heavy. Our senses are shocked. There is mourning and grief. There is righteous indignation. Father, senseless harm has occurred. And Lord, we know that our adversary delights in these days. We know that Satan himself desires that there be destruction and harm and division and wars and rumors of wars No, Father, it is beyond our grasp to understand that in this season, he is allowed still to move upon the face of this earth. And yet we are confident in this season that our God reigns. Father, in the midst of shelling and bombing, in the midst of fighting and looting and pillaging and violence, Our brothers and sisters, your children are standing firm and faithful. They are giving when they have but nothing to give. They are proclaiming the hope of the gospel when they must shout over the sounds of war. God, we lift them to you this day. We ask that you do what only you can do. We ask, God, that your kingdom come and your will be done in that place and in this place as it is in heaven. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters on the other side of the border. Father, they are trapped in a desperate place for to speak out brings the wrath of their own government. And yet many have begun to speak with a clarion voice. 
Father, I pray that your hand of mercy be upon them and that you raise up men and women who would stand for justice and righteousness, who would not flinch in the face of evil, but would stand in your refuge with your armor empowered by your spirit proclaiming your word. Lord, may we watch these moments and be deeply moved and reminded that evil is ever present around us. But, oh God, these days are short and help us to remember that we should not neglect so great a salvation even in the midst of this hour. Father, revive us. Renew us. Create in us a clean heart, a fresh to walk with you. It is in the name of Jesus we pray, amen. We've got a great who's your one display over here. Last week we encouraged you to take up the grace campaign and each of you were given a card like this if you didn't get one they're in the back and at the sides and I'd encourage you to get one today we want to take seriously praying for our neighbors and friends and family who are not walking faithfully with Jesus we want to take seriously inviting others to Rehoboth I'm not going to point anybody out because I'd never want to embarrass them, but I got to meet someone in our service this morning that is here because someone invited them this week. I'm telling you, yeah. I'm just going to give you a hint. We have many, many more chairs we can put in this room. Let's fill it up. Let's invite others to be a part of Rehoboth. We have challenged one another to share the good news with someone. And we are yearning to see the fruit of that, that folks would turn and follow Jesus Christ. So there are yellow ping pong balls and orange balls and green balls and pink balls. The yellow ball is if you pray for someone specifically, not just for the world in general to be saved, but specifically for someone that they would follow Jesus. We're asking you for each of those people to come up and drop a ball in for each of those persons. I was thrilled to see young people doing that this morning. I was thrilled to see staff doing that this morning. But I'm just going to tell you, I'm grieved that that thing's not almost half full today just from us praying alone. Orange is inviting others to come to Rehoboth. I, I, I was ecstatic at the end of our service last week when some came and they were dropping orange balls in for they were already, even last week, had invited some to be with us. The green balls represent sharing the gospel. That we would be gospel witnesses everywhere we go, that the gospel would just rub off of us, it would drip out of us, that it would flow from us, that we would be gospel heralds of the good news of Jesus Christ, and that we would have to order more and more green balls. And I nearly, well, I can't dance, I don't have any rhythm, but I almost got close when I saw a pink ball go in there early this morning, representing that someone in our Rehoboth family saw someone turn to follow Jesus Christ this week. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. I hope before you leave today that if you've prayed for anyone this week, you'll come and for each person drop a yellow ball in. If you have invited someone, let's celebrate what God is doing in our midst. We today have celebrated an extraordinary missions giving season. I am so proud of our church family. I am so thrilled and honored to be a part of this family. This is one of the largest seasons of missions giving that this church has experienced in at least a decade and a half, if not two decades. 
what an incredible thing it is and that we're going to be able to tell our partners in places where, frankly, in some cases, I can't even go that we're with them, we're standing with them, we're supporting the work that's being done, and to go boldly that the Rehoboth family is with them. And so even this week as I reflected on it, I got the information about midweek of where we were in our missions giving, and I just sat before the Lord and was just so incredibly grateful, and I wondered, do we really need a focus on renewal Do we really need to be pleading with the Lord, revive us, O Lord? And I think there's no doubt but that that is the case. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles or scroll to Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to spend a bit of time there. We're going to think about what the Lord is telling us with a question for revival. Revival doesn't mean that you and I have slipped completely off the path. The need to be renewed doesn't mean that we have entirely lost our way. But what the emphasis is, what the heart of revival is, is that we're not quite full. That we want some of Jesus, but not all of Jesus. That we have turned our eyes from much of this world, but not all of this world. And so in Hebrews, we find an extraordinary thing taking place in in this entire book. And I would encourage you to read through the book of Hebrews in the next few days or using an app on your phone or on your computer, your laptop or your tablet. Uh, You can go to a number of different websites and it will have, listen to the book of Hebrews. I want to help you see what's taking place here. This isn't hidden knowledge. This isn't some special revelation that God's given me alone. It's what he has shown us right here in the book. Jesus is compared to four things. Four things are, are there four comparisons made to Jesus. It's remarkable. In chapters one through three, angels and the law are compared to Jesus. In chapters 3 through 4, Moses and the promised land are compared to Jesus. Chapters 5 through 7, the priest in Melchizedek, that unique priest that we find in the Old Testament, to whom Abraham, when he sees him, gives him a tenth of all that he has as an offering. In chapters 8 through 10, Sacrifices and the covenant are compared to Jesus. In all of these, what we see is the unfolding of what come out of the very first words in this extraordinary letter to the churches. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, just listen, don't turn there, just listen. God's word says this, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his word, uh, excuse me, exact imprint of his nature, And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. The the book of Hebrews begins with this incredible statement that Jesus is above all. 
that there is nothing that compares to him. There is no one that compares to him. That he is more excellent, more worthy, more powerful than all that there is. And then the writer of Hebrews goes on then to back this up, to show this in comparing these four things. In each of these four comparisons, there are warnings. Some have taken those warnings to imply or to mean that someone can lose their salvation, that someone can go from being an adopted child of God to no longer being a child of God, that someone can go from being born again and made alive in Christ to now being dead in Christ or out of Christ again. And nothing could be further from the truth. That's not at all what these passages teach. But the warnings are there. They are not intended to cause us fear. They are not intended to cause any of us doubt. But they are intended to lead us to a place where we are uncomfortable. Where we look carefully. Where we make sure and we pursue passionately our relationship with Jesus Christ. These warnings and these comparisons are leading us more and more to Jesus, leading us more and more into his kingdom, leading us more and more toward his righteousness. They are a warning that you and I would not drift, that, that we wouldn't just simply slide over to the edge. They are a call to fresh repentance when we have drifted. Why is it that we need this season of renewal and revival? I've shared with you that as our pastors and directors got away last fall and we just fell before the Lord in times of prayer, we had some time that was fun, we spent time in the Word, we spent time planning and thinking about how the Lord was leading us and seeking His will for days ahead, there became a a, a unison of thought among our pastors that he really is leading us to a season that we would pursue renewal. When a church like ours has given so generously toward missions as has occurred in these last days, it can be said with much confidence, we have not lost our way. We are not off course. but it also should be reminded that we have the danger of drifting a bit. And maybe some who are even hearing this message today, that drift has already become real in your life. Your closest friends don't know it yet. You may not have even admitted it to yourself yet. But even now, you're no longer in the center of the lane and you're no longer pursuing Jesus with a singular focus in your life. Even now, it's Jesus plus something. And that plus something's really small today, but it's reflecting a, a shift, a drift. It may only be a degree today. Be assured in two weeks, it'll be a degree and a half. And in two years, it will be more. Before we jump into Hebrews 2, you need to see what was life like for these believers. They are being persecuted. They're not being persecuted because they're a part of one political party or another. They are not being persecuted because they root for the wrong team. They are being persecuted because they are followers of Jesus Christ. They are finding themselves in real hardship. From the text that we read in Hebrews, it is also clear that some have already been imprisoned and others are 
in danger of being imprisoned. Not because they failed to pay taxes to Caesar, but because they refuse to drift. This entire book, <coughs> this entire book is a reminder to them that Jesus is sufficient and he is above all. And this entire book is a reminder to them don't drift. Don't slide from the center. Don't be sucked to the edges. Make sure that your GPS has been calibrated. Make sure that the alignment on your spiritual life is absolutely centered on Christ and you're not drifting a bit. Read with me in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. We're going to look at Hebrews 2, 1 through 4 today. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? If we declared it first by the Lord, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I want to share with you three thoughts out of this passage. Three things for us to be guided by and to think carefully about as you and I consider a question for revival. And here's the first. Angels declared a reliable message. Based on Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 2, Jews believed that when Moses went to Mount Sinai, that God is surrounded by an enormous gathering of angels and that it is the messenger angels who take the law, the Torah, and actually give it to Moses. That yes, Moses encounters God himself there on Mount Sinai, but it is angels who are actually the messengers taking the message from God and giving it to Moses. In this text, there is a, an, an incredible declaration that is extraordinary as angels are, as powerful as they are, as great a messenger as they are, that they would have delivered the Torah, the law to Moses. They ain't nothing compared to Jesus. The law itself, it guided the children of Israel in how to live and how to relate to one another how to preserve life and even dietary guides. It was a law that protected the children of Israel that they would walk righteously after their God. It was a law that revealed God's justice. And it was a law that revealed His grace. The law itself pointed to salvation. But the law was never intended to be the means of salvation, for the law itself cannot save. It is nothing more than a beacon pointing to the one who could save. Think of this. God has taken the children of Israel and he has taken them out of Egypt. Now, you just got to put yourself there for a minute. He didn't give them a cruise that all they had to do was go. No, 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 no. He sends Moses into Pharaoh. There are 10 plagues. It is extraordinary. The world changes, and Moses declares, get out of here. No sooner than the children of Israel literally loot the Egyptians for their gold and silver and precious fabrics. 
that Moses gathers up his army and they pursue after the children of Israel. The children of Israel are standing on the banks of the Nile. There is no way they can cross. They're not armed to be an army. There is no way they can defend themselves against the Egyptian army. God then takes Moses and leads him and empowers him to part the Red Sea. Are you with me? There's no CGI. There's no graphic illusions going on here. This happened. Can you imagine a little Israelite boy as they're walking through? He reaches over and he sticks his finger in the wall of water. There are some of you who would have done that. His mama snatches him. And they cross on dry land. Pharaoh's army descends down into the Nile, the Red Sea. And the walls of water envelop them. For decades and decades and decades, it, there were those who said, there's no way this could have ever happened. There's no, no evidence that it could. And even geographically, it doesn't seem possible until just a few years ago when they find an enormous cache of chariots and war equipment in the bottom. Now, don't you think if you have seen God do these things that you would believe he could do anything? Don't you think if, if you have been the recipients of his mercy and his grace that if he would do these things on your behalf, that if he said, go run across Lawrenceville Highway and a car will not hit you, that you can run across Lawrenceville Highway? The children of Israel come to the promised land. They come to Canaan, and 12 spies are sent into the land. And they come back, and they're bringing grapes the size of basketballs. And they're talking about a land that flows with milk and honey, and that it is extraordinary. It is an incredibly lush place. It would make a phenomenal home except for one thing. They are big, and they are armed. Ten of the twelve say, oh, we can't do this. Two of the twelve said, uh, he can. We must. And the children of Israel back up, and they don't say we're going to deny God. They simply say, we're not taking that one step forward. They drifted that much or that little And God's judgment upon them was that that entire generation of Israelites would not cross into Canaan. That entire generation and all with them would walk around in the desert like lost camels for 40 years. Not because they denied God outwardly and overtly, but just a little, and they drifted just a step. Not now. Not this time. We can't. This text shows us that Jesus is so much above even the angels and the law that God has given, and that drift it was simply one step of disbelief. Are you hearing me? Satan wants us to think that if we run 20 feet that way or 20 feet that way, that's when we've gone off path. And what God is showing us, what God desires to do is renew our hearts and our lives that we would walk in the center of his will because if we drift a degree we're missing all that God desires to do in us and through us. If we drift a degree, we are saying, Jesus is the almost greatest. When we drift a degree, we're saying he is superior over most. But he is not superior over all. 
The second thing that we see in this text is that Jesus declared a greater message. Look in verses 3 and 4. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his... Oh, excuse me, I'm reading chapter 1. I got so excited. I could hear y'all. I heard you. Some of y'all think really loud. Verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. The message of God, God's word, God's revelation to us was first declared by angels and the law, and Jesus has declared a message far superior to that, far greater to that. It is the message that Jesus saves. The law could never declare that message. The angels could never declare that message about the law. But Jesus himself is God, and he himself has declared that all who would call upon his name would be saved. In John 14, 6, Jesus tells his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes into the Father except through me. Folks, I'm just telling you, you don't need Jesus as one of your ways. You know, on your, your, if you use a GPS much, and my family will tell you I'm just awful with directions. You can tell me the five steps it is to get here and I'm already lost. I get really <laughs> aggravated when my GPS acts like a nincompoop. I don't know about yours, but mine once in a while, I'm telling you that thing is demon possessed. It'll tell me turn right here. I am two, 20 feet beyond the turn. I can't turn right there. And then it has this option that lets me pick different routes, the fastest route, the shortest route, the route with the fewest turns. I'm just telling you, with Jesus, there's one route. There's one way. There's one GPS. And there is nothing that compares anything like it. And he is saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You don't need anything else. You don't want anything else. Don't follow anything else. But we are so bad about pulling out our phone and going, oh, I don't know, Jesus. It looks like there's some heavy traffic coming up. I'm going to check this alternate. Oh, yeah, it's two minutes faster. And what you find is it cost you 20 years out of your life to try to save those two minutes. It was just a little drift, a slight drift. In John 14, Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Can you imagine the boldness of this guy? Hey, you're pretty good, but I want the best. We want to see God the Father. Here's what Jesus said. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. I'm telling you, God himself has witnessed that Jesus is in fact the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Even back in Hebrews 1, that's why I keep coming back here. I, I, I'm just so mesmerized by what is said about the Son in verse 2. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Are you hearing this, who Jesus is? And then he says, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. What he is saying in, in just a, a beautiful way that we could spend so much time reflecting on is that when you're looking at the sun and you see the rays of the sun coming out, that is the sun 
And it is saying that Jesus is in fact the radiant rays you see coming out of the sun. He is none other than the sun. He is God. And he declared a greater message. It is first declared by him. God has revealed not only himself in Jesus, but he has revealed the grace and the hope of salvation. When he looks at Matthew, he doesn't say, hey, believe these 10 things and you're going to be okay. He looks at Matthew and he says, follow me. Follow me. Follow me when the road's narrow. Follow me when the sky is dark. Follow me when the wind blows. Follow me when everyone else abandons. Follow me when your flesh fights against you. Follow me, follow me, follow me. Finally, we must not neglect this salvation message. We must not neglect this salvation message. I told you at the beginning is that, that ultimately we see that the, the people to whom this letter is written, life is incredibly difficult for them. And the, and the writer of Hebrews, as he is following the Spirit of God, doesn't say, hey, just hold on to Jesus. It's going to get easy. He doesn't say that. For Jesus is the one who died on the cross. What he says on so many occasions through these warnings again and again and again is that Jesus is greater than all and that he is sufficient. Don't forget it. Don't drift. Don't be discouraged. And you will not be defeated. That's what he is saying. In Hebrews 2 verse 3 It is this powerful, pointed question. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? That idea of neglecting, it it has a range Sometimes we see these horrific stories of people who've neglected dogs or cats or horses, sometimes even cattle, and some have died, and they're so thin you don't even know how they could survive. But neglect is a range. It's not always the extreme. In fact, oftentimes it's just the little things, just the little thing that we neglect to do. It's the little step we neglected to take. A number of years ago, I sat with a Ukrainian Baptist pastor and his wife. They're just a beautiful couple. And she shared with us, in fact, I got to see them, that her grandfather had kept journals during days when the czars had persecuted followers of Jesus to the point of death and where then ultimately the Orthodox Church had persecuted them to the point of beatings and destroying their buildings. Her grandfather had been arrested on three different occasions. He was a pastor. He refused to stop preaching the word He was placed in prison each time, and each time the family knew that it was likely that he would not survive for not only the the mistreatment he would experience, the harshness of often being so cold and having no means to warm himself, no legitimate medical care, often malnourished, often without even enough water, trapped in a loneliness where even the family would never be allowed to see him. And her grandmother, through long seasons of fasting and praying and fasting and praying, at times they weren't sure that her grandmother would even survive because of the long seasons of fasting that she would enter into. On three different occasions, her grandfather was released. 
we see moments like that and we see what faithful believers in Ukraine, and, and Ukrainian brothers and sisters are no more empowered with the Spirit of God than you are. They are no more perfect than you are. They struggle with sin just like you do. They are tempted to drift just like you and I are tempted to drift. But among them, there is a staggering, overwhelming history of faithfulness again and again and again and again. When they were told that they cannot meet together, they continued to meet together. When they were told that you cannot preach the word, they continued to preach the word. And when one who was proclaiming the word would be taken out, another would rise up and proclaim the word. When they were told that you cannot believe, they would continue to believe when they were told that you cannot invite others to follow Jesus, literally an army of missionaries came out of Ukraine and went throughout all of Eastern Europe. That's not hypothetical. That is actual realities. Extraordinary. And yet, you and I are so tempted to drift because we didn't like the music this morning. Because somebody didn't wear the right clothes this week. Because somebody had the audacity to sit in my space, park in my spot. And we become completely undone. Satan doesn't have to have hurricane winds to cause us to drift most days. He simply needs to go, and we run off course over such trivial, petty, inconsequential matters. I don't like to get up early. I don't like to be around people. I don't always understand what they say. Listen, I'm just going to tell you up front. If you read God's word and you understand everything that's in there and you're a follower of Jesus, it makes you normal. Because you're not God. And he has given his spirit that he might teach us. And he has given pastors and teachers that they might instruct us from the word of God. I am so grateful to be a part of a church that loves the Word of God and that has pastors and teachers who seek to teach it faithfully. We are so easy to drift into gossip and backbiting and all manner of things. And the cry that we have from the Word of God is, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And here would be the temptation The temptation would be for me to say, stop it. Okay, I did, all right? I got it out. But that's not what the Word says. Here's the conclusion of the Word. It's not a focus on stop doing this. It is a focus on follow Him, follow Him. He's greater than everything. Be consumed by Him. Dear friends, we face incredible days. This season with COVID has been so difficult and on all of us for different reasons. In the last week, I, I, I literally driving down the road, I'm watching the gas prices going, you're, you're, you, you would think it's a basketball game and the score's going up. I, I went into a store yesterday, I told Tina this, I, I was I, I don't do a lot of shopping in stores. It's not because I'm against it. I just, I just don't. I, but I was in a store yesterday. It wasn't a grocery store. It was another kind of store. I, w- I haven't been in this store two, three years at least, maybe four. I was stunned at, at how where there had been shelves and racks and it was just full and you could hardly... And, and how there, there were these big aisles and, and how many of the racks had been moved and a lot of the products they used to add, they're not in the store anymore. I've grieved over people who used to sit with us weekly and regularly who for various reasons, some couldn't and some wouldn't, are not walking faithfully with the body. And some couldn't, but others could. 
my, my, my call to us is not simply that we would fill this up for the sake of filling it up, but that we would be so enraptured with Jesus, we couldn't help but want everybody to know about him. So when you're standing in line this week and you're buying groceries, or whether you're having groceries delivered or you're doing the pickup, when the person comes, it's this easy. Hey, I want to invite you to Rehoboth. They're like, Rehoboth? What is Rehoboth? And then you tell them, it's that easy. It's that easy to make a list of people that you would pray for that they might know Jesus. It is this easy that you would get into God's word, you would take up your cross daily, you would die to self, and you'd get in the center of the lane. I'm going to invite our worship team to join us here on the platform And I'm going to ask you in this moment just to bow your heads and to close your eyes. My prayer and my plea is that you and I would cry out to the Lord today and say, renew in me a right spirit and a clean heart. That even the little things that have allowed me to drift a little Oh God, I confess them and I repent of them. I acknowledge that Jesus is above all. And I have let my eyes fall on the things of this world too much. That I have allowed the distractions of this age to move me out of the center of the path. Will you just pray? Father, you have done a work in us through Jesus Christ that is the marvel of the ages. It is a great salvation. We are unworthy, and we did not even desire it apart from your Spirit moving in our lives. Father, we plead with you, revive us, renew us. Oh God, we drift and we want to be in the middle of your word, your way, and your spirit. Revive us, Lord. Lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Pastor Marvin's going to lead us in this final response song. If you want to come pray with someone, don't leave here today without doing that. If the Lord has moved on your heart, and you know there's something you need to address. There's just been a little drift. 
<clears throat> and he's shown you today, don't neglect the move of his spirit because I'm telling you, there is none greater than Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us amen. Hallelujah. today. We are so thankful that you worship with us. We are so thankful that you joined us today. To all of our first time guests, to all of our first time guests, if you're online, please drop us a note so we can contact you. But if you're in the building, and if this is your very first time worshiping with us, if you will meet Brad at that table right over there, we would love to just share a small gift to say thank you for worshiping with us. And to you, we love you. We thank you for worshiping with us. If you're going to attend the Rehoboth, Discover Rehoboth, we're going to meet in the chapel in about three or four minutes here. So just meet us over in the chapel. We love you. God bless you. Have an incredible, incredible week. And remember, God loves you, and he's looking for you to love on somebody this week. God bless you. Take care this week. Hallelujah, find the glory.